Today, we're doing animal makeup. Animal makeup, uh, you sometimes need to do for children's theater, but most often uh, I regard this as mainly an exercise in using the skills that you have been learning for doing character makeup of how to go and alter the shape of your features to match that of a person with a different skull shape than yourself. Now, the reason that animal makeup is really useful as a practice for this is animals have completely different skull shapes. So, when you're going to go and do an animal makeup, you're going to be trying to give the impression that you have a radically different skull shape, plus usually you'll also be putting on the markings of whatever fur or feathers that particular animal has. Now, the best ones to do for this exercise are flat-faced animals, ones that don't have that much of a long snout. You can do ones like dogs and so on that have long snouts, but since you're primarily doing this for practice, if you're trying to simply learn how to move those features about and you want to pick something that is much more difficult than simply doing human alterations on your face, but not so difficult that you are really, really having trouble making the change. Uh, starting with an idea for a flat-faced animal is good. Flat-faced animals include cats, pug dogs, um, lemurs, tarsiers, apes, monkeys, um, Pretty much those are the, the most popular ones to go and do because they all have a little bit less long of a snout than uh, most other animals. And the apes and monkeys are, you know, actually related to us, so the differences are relatively small. It is, however, much bigger of a change than you'd be doing if you were doing um, simply another sort of person. So it's kind of like doing push-ups in makeup. You're doing this as an exercise to practice moving those bones about, and yet not moving them about so much that you're simply painting a design of this is a dog, this is a cat, this is a whatever on your face, and having it that the moment you try and move your face, it won't move in the right way. You need to somehow make the mouth coincide with your mouth you somehow need to make your eyes coincide with the eyes. And uh, you have to go and account for or hide whatever you're doing for your nose. So if you want to go and do this makeup, you're gonna have to figure out how your face can be adapted to look more like these alternate skull-shaped animals uh, without going and moving things so radically that Yes, we have a perfectly shaped and proportioned eye, but it happens to be in the middle of the forehead. <laughs> or, yes, the mouth on uh, this kind of animal is at the very end of their face, so I'm going to put the mouth here. Of course, there's going to be this little problem of the fact that the mouth that I'm talking with is going to be up here. So you want to go and use this mainly as an exercise. It is, however, also useful if you're doing different kinds of children's theater and other sorts of uh, non-realistic theater that have humans playing animals. <clears throat> now, another skill that it goes and gives you practice at is going and laying out a makeup plan that doesn't involve putting down a base and putting on simply highlight and shadow, but where you have to go and plan by doing a rendering ahead of time where sections of color are going to be on your face. This is the sort of thing you end up having to do for clown makeup and a lot of other not so realistic styles of makeup. So, for instance, for this uh, Shoelace the Cat uh, makeup, I'm gonna go and do a set of outlines on my face to go and use as guides for a kind of color by number thing that it's gonna happen on my face. Uh, certain 
makeups, you can go and put down a base first if it, the animal has predominantly one color on its face and just small amounts of color by number sections. But if like uh, Shoelace the tabby, she uh, has a lot of different colors going on all over the face and it's going to actually be simpler if I simply put in the outlines and then fill in each of those sections with their highly contrasting colors. That way I don't get a sort of muddy thing happening on my face. So I'm putting in the outlines and one of the things I'm wanting to do is I want to widen the nose because cats have wider flatter noses than humans and a household cat has been crossbred for generations to have much larger eyes than wild varieties of cats. They've been crossbred this way by humans who think large-eyed creatures look like human babies and are cute. So baby cats when they were being domesticated the ones that had the biggest eyes were considered cutest and got saved and those that were not considered cutest did not get saved and so over many generations household cats have acquired very very big eyes now what I'm doing here is I'm following I want to get large eyes I want to, however, have them move in a way that makes use of the way my own face moves. So the shape of the eyes, I'm actually altering a little bit so that it follows the lines of the eyebrow, so that when that eyebrow is difficult to get rid of, it will conveniently be in the middle of a dark shadow anyway, won't show up. And the bottom part of the eye is at the bottom part of this bag, the section of my face that moves. So that when I want to move the eyes of the cat and make things happen, they will follow along with those muscles in my face. Other things I'm gonna wanna do. Now, a cat in addition to having a flatter nose, has a rather longer nose in proportion on its face than a human. So I'm going to go and make the tip of the nose go down here. And lay that out. Cats have extremely narrow lips. And in fact, on a lot of cats, you won't even see the fact that they have them because their fur is sufficient to conceal it. But very wide ones. And in the case of Shoelace, hers went up at the corners, at least most of the time. She's a cat who smiled. And goes there. Another thing that's different is cats, almost as soon as they have their mouth, just below that, just a little below their lower lip, uh, their face ends. So this chin doesn't exist on a cat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and make a mark of where Shoelace's chin would end, like here. And when it comes to putting in shadow, I'm going to put in a lot of shadow under that area so that visually from a distance, this chin will recede in apparent, it, it won't seem to be sticking out so much. It'll sort of go in. Now, there's also a section up here and here and here 
As you can see, I'm not doing these lines very hard. I'm just doing enough so that I can see where the blocks of color go. This kind of pre-planning makes it a little bit simpler when putting in something as complicated as this kind of a makeup. These are just sort of rough guides. Oh, that's not bilaterally symmetrical. So let's make it more so. There. So this is just the basic outline for what I want to get for her face. Now, <clears throat> tabby cats, in addition to having their features be somewhat different because of the skull shape, they also have a complicated fur pattern on their face. One of the reasons I've chosen Shoelace's tabby cat patterns is something I've noticed about uh, cat faces. People sometimes talk about cats not having very expressive faces. And I think perhaps that the people who think that have cats with solid color faces. Uh, because in our house, we have had uh, shoelace, uh, who had these very um, kabuki-like markings on her face as a tabby, and Mu, who is a Siamese cat, which has a sort of black snout fading to dark brown up here. What this did on Mu is it goes and seems to flatten her face out and makes it that you can almost not read any of her expressions except when she's under very bright light or you're very, very close to her. Shoelace, on the other hand, with all these little stripes along all the lines of the muscles of her face, every time she would flicker an eyelid from across the room, you could go and tell what she was thinking and feeling. All her little expressions were very easy to read. And it's interesting that if you take household cats, any weird combination of household cats, and they're set all off in a corner and become feral cats and intermarry, the dominant genes that end up after many generations are versions of tabby cat genes that have these stripes. Uh, apparently, among cats, particularly when they're out in semi-wild situations like feral cats have, uh, their social structure depends tremendously on their facial expressions. Their facial uh, muscles, actually they have more facial muscles than we do, which indicates that it's pretty important for them. So when you've got uh, rural colonies of these, they go toward the tabby genes that have these very expressive looking faces where they can go and telegraph their emotions from a distance. However, we've bred separate species of cat that have solid color faces because we find them pretty, but the result is that we can't actually read their expressions as well. Why this is important in a makeup class is because of these kinds of tabby markings, you can amplify expression. You know this from the way that works on the cats. And that's exactly what you do when you're putting on a extreme old age makeup or a stylized makeup or a kabuki makeup that uses these strong stripes and things in it, these very extreme highlights and shadows because they help you telegraph emotion at a distance the same way it does for a cat. So. Uh, I'm going to go and put on fur pattern. Now what's interesting about shoelace is if I were to be completely literal about her fur color, her fur color was in actual fact uh, a sort of pale creamy yellow, you know, just a little bit more yellow than a human white person's skin tone, and uh, black. But what's interesting is if you look at photographs of her, that gave off the impression actually of being brown because the black and the yellow together ended up looking more like this in spots. So I'm actually going to use brown in parts of the makeup on this face even though the actual fur is this black and yellow. I'll use black as the strongest parts and yellow in there as well, but the uh, dominant color is actually going to be brown because I'm going to be trying to simplify the makeup in order to make it read on stage as brown. So, uh, first step, I'm going to put the light colors in. 
char the yellows. Some of the yellows fade out in her face to actual whites. So I'm putting in the yellow and in the places where it gets lightest, I'm going to put white over that as a highlighter. So first, sort of tan yellow sections. In general, it helps to go and start off using your lighter colors and then putting darker colors on them later. The reason for that is your dark colors have a much easier time messing about and getting into your light colors if you do the dark ones first, whereas the light colors usually don't cause quite as much havoc on the dark colors. <laughs> so. So that's the yellow sections. Now I'm going to mix white into those sections using short hair like strokes. This will help to suggest fur. Depending on the size of the theater, this is something you'd probably want to do in a mid-sized theater where little bits of these brush strokes would work. If, however, you're dealing with a very large one, you actually want to do more like that, where you're just making a highlight and a shadow. And simplifying it down to a little bit more color by number look. But I'm going to show the furry way.
notice that I'm trying to make the direction of the strokes follow the logical direction that fur would go. Someplace else uh, that I want to make a particular point of putting in highlighter, even if you were dealing with a cat that didn't have a fur pattern that had light spots here, you'd want to go and put some lighter color in here to go and make these areas that are sunken in on a human face seem to come out and flatten out as they would be on a cat face. That's most of the highlight areas. Um, an intriguing bit on the tip of my particular cat's nose is she had a slightly pink nose. What's useful about this is, of course, a human nose sticks out in the way that a cat's nose does not. It sort of flattens out. and. Fortunately, her pattern included this slightly pink nose with a little bit of a dark center, which is like reverse. It's shadowing an area that would normally have a highlight, which tends to flatten out the appearance of the nose. Finally, under here, rosy pink. Okay. The 
next color I'm going to work on is brown. As I said, she didn't really have brown fur, though you'd think she did if you were looking at it not too carefully. So I'm going to put brown in fairly thinly in the sections that are in fact mostly black with little bits of yellow fur. In reality it would be a whole series of pale yellow and black strokes, but the truth is if you did that you'd just end up with a mess on your face. You wouldn't actually get something that looked like the way she looks. So you're going to go sort of chocolate color. And now I'm going and pretty well blocking out the chin. Using a dark color. I highly recommend, if you are a costume designer, that if you're having somebody do this kind of an animal, like a cat, and they're going to be using something that is this kind of a makeup color, you want to make it 
as little necessary to put this stuff on somebody's neck as you can because whatever it is that they've got is going to get all over the costume. And a good trick, and one that you'll see in a fair number of the costumes in the musical Cats, is what they'll do is they'll have a washable thing up to here, and then they'll have a little section here that's made out of something like ostrich feathers, so that it suggests fur, but it's a simple little piece that can come off. <laughs> and so if it gets scrunched up and uh, can't be washed or whatever, uh, it's easily removable. So you want to go and have something here that makes it so you're not having to put a ton of makeup on and then stick it into a costume, at which point all that stuff is going to come off onto the, makeup, uh, the, onto the costume. So ideally you want to go and find something that you can put around here on an animal costume that is either easy to wash or uh, which is something that's easily disposable, like a little set of feathers or some such thing that's not too costly. Now, when you have a makeup like this, and you get a itch, you're pretty much having to use either a tiny bit of poking. I really itch right here for some reason. Uh, this is not something you want to do a lot of messing about with your face. And now, I got most of the major areas blocked in. As I say, the real color that's there is a lot of black and a little bit of tan. So I'm now going to put in the black in those spots so that I can get the fur pattern to show up. I'll put the black in those parts where it's most obvious that it is black when you look at the face of the cat. As I say, shoelace did have visible lips, not very big ones, little tiny cat lips like usual, but they were pigmented black. section. Then, where I'm trying to make the chin disappear, I run a line so the chin has disappeared. This is just the bottom of the chin. 